completely different than my normal painting videos. I'll be showing you how I painted this cat across miniature, but because this was kind of an experiment on something new that I was trying out, I don't want to sit here preaching that I'm an authority on this subject, which is totally not what I normally do. Anyway, rather than meticulously going through each of the steps, I'll instead be discussing the techniques and colours I decided to use and explaining why I decided to use them. Now, first of all, let's talk about the scheme I've chosen here, whilst Catagross continues to pirouette for our amusement. So, the miniature itself is quite an interesting one, as it's essentially a mini diorama with our Prometheus Engineer cosplayer Catagross taking centre stage. Now, if you're prone to being triggered, then take a deep breath now, because I don't like the heavy metal scheme for Catagross. Now, don't get me wrong, the technical ability used in that painting Painting that model looks great as always, but I felt that they opted for too many bright colours, which across the five models results in a model that looks like it has too much going on. Therefore, I decided to go down the path of muted tones to give us a more moody appearance, which suits this race of undead nicely. This darker theme would also allow us to apply the brighter colours, like the purple here, in order to emphasise certain details. Okay, so let's kick things off by magnetising the model. This isn't strictly required, but having Catacross's little buddies being removable will not only make for some awesome fridge magnets, but also make it easy to paint the model overall. But best of all, it offers some in-game functionality, as you can remove the retinue as Catacross takes wounds, representing them getting killed off in battle. I'm using some tiny little neodymium magnets here of 1mm and 2mm in diameter. I start by drilling holes into the feet and supergluing a magnet into the hole. This is then repeated in the spot that you want the model to be placed and repeated across the four other models in the retinue. With everything magnetized, we can begin priming. I'm starting with black here because this is going to be the darkest points of our shadows and we can steadily lighten things up as we apply our paint. I'm using an airbrush and some of Vallejo's black airbrush primer over the miniature, but an aerosol spray is fine here too. You'll notice that I've created some little miniature holders here which are incredibly simple to create. Just drill a hole in the feet and insert a length of one millimeter wire with one end bent around on itself to create a convenient, if low tech, miniature holder. Now our first task is to give our miniature that blue glow that you saw in the finished model, but I wanted to represent a kind of stylized bright moonlight falling on the troops. Now the easiest way for me to achieve this was with an airbrush, which I know some guys don't have access to an airbrush, but you could instead use the same colors I'm using here mixed with the beast grave dry brushing technique that I used in that video before, so check out that video, there'll be a link in the description to show you how you can dry brush to create a similar effect here. So anyway, for the blue, I needed to start with something that was very dark. So I created a mixture of one part black paint to three parts Stegodon scale green, thinned with some airbrush thinner to create the mixture that you see here. I then began spraying this mixture over the model from above. I held my brush at a slight angle over the right of the miniature and just a little bit behind it, essentially recreating a light source with the sprayed paint working as light falling on the model. For this first step, however, I used a fairly wide arc of spray, allowing the paint to fall over more of the model. By angling the spray in this way, the appearance of a light source over Catacross's left shoulder begins to take shape, with his and his retinue's right and front sides being left mostly black. Continuing with the airbrushing, we can next move on to the lighter colour of pure Stegodon scale green, thinned out and sprayed through the airbrush once again. Now this time I'm focusing my application from the same angle as before, but slightly decreasing the angle in that arc that we did use last time. This will result in the start of a transition leading from the black to a progressively lighter blue. So for this next step, I created a mixture of equal parts staggered on scale green and Thousand Suns blue and thinned it out. This mixture will be a slightly lighter blue than before, and once again I'm running it through the airbrush. Rather than applying the paint over a general area like before, this time around I'm going to be specifically focusing this paint on areas that sit closer to the top and rear side of the miniatures, which in most cases are going to be around the back of the head as well as behind the left shoulder. By being more focused here, we can help to emphasize particular points of the miniature and increase how brightly the moonlight appears to be shining on them. I'll be finishing off the airbrushing with some Thousand Suns Blue using the focus technique like before, just with a reduced area of application which will complete our transitions from black to blue to light blue. The result of this application of various blue paints 
means that we have the basis of our external light source. And by choosing this kind of technique, also means you can tell your friends all about your artistic vision, when really the only reason you did it was because it means you only have to properly paint half a model because the rest is blue. So once I completed the airbrushing, I then moved on to more detailed proper brushwork to add a little more color to the miniatures. However, rather than going through each and every step, I'll instead be going over the paints I used and in what order, because that's a 100% better way, and definitely not because I got carried away and forgot to film half the stuff I should have done. Anyway, at this point, I wanted a limited palette of colors that were more muted to help boost how bright the blue appeared in comparison. I ultimately settled on using three paints, a red, a brown and a very dark grey. The exact colours here don't matter, it just, just whatever you prefer, but these particular paints are from the Vallejo's range and I'll include their names in the description. So obviously I needed darker and lighter versions of these paints to bring out those details. However, instead of using entirely different paints, I decided to mix in black and white paints to give me my range of colours. Normally I avoid doing this as mixing in black and white paint will affect the lightness of the paint but also causes the colour to be a little more muted as you're not adding any more coloured pigment. However, for my purposes, this was perfect as I wanted a more subdued colour scheme anyway. Plus, it also meant I saved myself like £10 all the while claiming it was for purely aesthetic reasons. So for each of the paints I used, I created a mixture of one part black to three parts colour. I used a pure version of the colour on its own and also created a mixture of equal parts paint to white. In some areas, like the bone and the grey, I also created a two parts white to one part paint mix too. In addition to these three basic colours, I wanted some paints to help me enhance the blues, with some specific highlights. For those, I opted for Thousand Suns Blue, Araman Blue and Araman Blue mixed with white in equal amounts. So now that I have my palette set out, I can begin working on my miniature. So before we progress, let's skip ahead and in true Blue Peter fashion, here's one I made earlier. So this is the Legion Mortis painted with the colours I've just shown being mixed and I wanted to focus on the finished miniature in order to better demonstrate the concepts I'm trying to discuss here. The first thing you'll notice is all the colours, as I mentioned earlier, are quite muted, which makes the blue on the side and back of the model look much more intense in contrast. These were only painted on the areas that were left mostly untouched from the original airbrushing step. I've also made use of strong shadows too. Areas that are tucked away in the recesses have just been left black. These darker parts not only save us a massive headache in struggling to reach them with a brush, but it's yet another way you can be lazy with your painting and just claim that you did it to add to the overall realism of your model or something. So how did I go about applying the paints to get this result? Well, for the most part, the techniques were identical regardless of the paint colour, which is useful because I remembered to only film me painting the areas of bone. You only get top-notch quality on this channel. So I began by choosing a colour, either bone, grey, red or brown, and giving that area a coat of its darkest mixture first, followed by a layer of the middle column of paint that was then applied over the same area whilst leaving the deeper recesses with the darker shade. Over this, I then picked out the most upper edges with a small amount of the paint plus white mixture and then finished off with a small dot on the corners of the lightest mixture we had created where applicable. For all of these steps, I thinned my paints with some airbrush thinner as I found that this resulted in a much easier to control mixture than it didn't simply pour straight into the recesses when I applied it. The strong pigmentation of the Vallejo paint combined with a slightly lower viscosity meant I could quickly apply my base coat and create smoother transitions between each layer. The mixture also stayed wetter for longer which gave me the chance to feather it out and with a brush dampened with more thinner. Some areas that I came across had an area of blue next to an area of colour on the same flat panel. For these areas I just decided to keep the area between them as dark as possible so you go colour dark and then colour again and this gave me the most realistic result. For some areas that I felt should have had their shadows darkened I directly applied some thin black paint into their recesses. This helped create some much sharper corners and really boosted the level of detail. For the blue areas I adopted a similar technique of progressing from the darkest blue to the lightest blue however this time I was using the paints to enhance what we had already started with the airbrushing. I used the Thousand Suns Blue to pick out most of the edges, making sure to use some more airbrush thinner to help smooth out those transitions. Following this, Araman Blue and the lighter white paint mixture was then applied over the details towards the tops of the shoulders, essentially being used to pick out the details that we earlier sprayed with Thousand Suns Blue. By applying these highlights over the airbrushed areas, I was able to sharpen up some of the details that airbrushing can often end up softening and smoothing out. 
So at this stage, I have my blue and my non-blue areas both completed. But the problem that I have now is that by painting these models with duller colors, I've been left with a pretty dull looking model. What it needs is some pizzazz, which incidentally is the first and last time that I'll be using that word out loud ever again. I chose purple to be the focus color here for a few reasons. First of all, it contrasts nicely against the blue areas of light, which meant I could apply it over the top of them. It also fits in nicely with the overall eerie appearance of an undead armory. And finally, it's the color most closely associated with the realm of Shaish and the law of death. So the application here is much the same as before. I began with a base coat of Screamer Pink, applied over all the crystals, runes and eyes of the models. I then mix in a little of my airbrush thinner into my paint again, and applying this transparent mixture over the areas immediately surrounding those purple light sources. This is the start of a subtle glow effect. It takes a little imagination to get us right, but this paint should be applied to the areas that will be touched by the light, such as immediately around the sockets or the settings where the gems are placed. Next up, I opted for the lighter Empress Children paint. This is quite a bit lighter than the Screamer paint, but this will just enhance the glowing effect. I chose to apply this as an edge highlight along the facets of the gems, and also to pick out the sharper corners of the runes. Again, by mixing in some thinner, I then continued the glowing effect by picking out the more prominent points next to the light source, and just covering a smaller area than I did last time. Finally, I finish things off with a small dot of fulgrim pink on the corners of the gems and to finish off that light emitting effect. And so that concludes this look into how I painted the handsome Squidward known as Catacross. Whilst it wasn't quite as in depth as my other videos, hopefully you were able to get some small nuggets of useful information from the six pages worth of script that went into this video. If you enjoyed this video, then great news, I have lots more for you to keep watching along with their associated adverts. So go check those out and subscribe to be kept up to date with my latest videos. But before I go, let me just give a big thank you to you guys who support me on Patreon. Your continued support in making in these videos is amazing and I really appreciate your help. If you'd like to help me out too, I've included my Patreon page in the description below where you can donate to me from as little as a dollar a month. And for anyone looking to chat with others about wargaming and stuff about this channel, I've set up a Discord server, which you can find a link to in the description. So, the only thing left to say is, thanks for watching, and goodbye.